my gentle and of course very modern apes we're back with the library of errors it's been a hot minute since we've done one of these episodes and the reason as i mentioned in a community post is because i was taking hominin evolution around the time that i started the contested bones sort of season of library of errors and the more that i took the class the more we had class in session the more i realized that i wanted to complete it before i really tackled the rest of contested bones so now the class is over and I'm ready to get back to uh, suplexing Christopher Roop and John Sanford through the table in Minecraft and Roblox, of course. For those of you unaware, Contested Bones is a book meant to overturn all of paleoanthropology in favor of a young earth creationist interpretation of hominin fossils, which basically boils down to saying uh, some hominins, they're just humans and the rest of them are just apes. If that sounds kind of funky, it is, and we'll continue to investigate why. It's by Christopher Roop and John Sanford, almost a Dr. John Sanford, I probably should say that, and Dr. John Sanford, uh, neither of whom is a paleoanthropologist or a paleontologist or really anybody who has any business saying anything about the fossil record or anatomy in general. Last time we tackled their coverage of Homo neanderthalensis, and today we're going to be covering Homo erectus. Uh, and if you're wondering what I mean when I say Homo erectus, like which hominins are we actually including in that, Sanford and Roop don't know either. And this is going to become problematic for their interpretation of the species as a whole, which we'll get to momentarily. Before we begin though, I wanna talk for a minute about Homo erectus because Homo erectus as a hominin has some issues that other hominins don't really face, at least not as fervently. So Homo erectus is challenging because anthropologists tend to disagree on whether it is a single, highly variable and effectively global species, or whether it's several different species and the species are kind of determined by some morphologic criteria and some chronologic criteria and indeed some geographic criteria. These guys are kind of colloquially understood to be lumpers versus splitters. So lumpers say that all of these specimens are indeed Homo erectus, regardless of when and where they are and sort of the minutia of their uh, craniodental features or postcranial or whatever. And the splitters tend to say, no, we're actually looking at a couple of different species. So what are those species and where do we find them? This is important because we're going to be talking about these different species and their morphology and when they're found as well as where in the world with relation to Sanford and Roof's coverage of Homo erectus sensulato or in a broad sense. I take the opinion mostly of the consensus that there is at least two species present in what has been in the past conventionally called Homo erectus, and I'll actually take a little bit further and say that I'm in the camp that considers there to be three species within Homo erectus sensu leto, or in that broad sense again. So who are these species? Where and when did they live? What's the deal here? The first of these is going to be Homo georgicus. So Homo georgicus is this group of hominins that lived in Georgia, not the United States Georgia, but the Middle East version of Georgia, you know, the original one. And these hominins are, I think, deserving a uni of a unique status because they've got a lot of kind of traits that they share with earlier hominins, like Homo habilis, and they also have some of the derived characteristics that can be found in the later Homo erectus. This is also the oldest for sure Homo erectus-like looking thing at 1.8-ish million years old. Then there's Homo ergaster. Homo ergaster is a little bit more recent than Homo georgicus, around 1.7 to 1.4 million years old. And these guys can be found in East Africa. They're more derived consistently than Homo georgicus, and they tend to have that postcrania that looks more familiar to Homo sapiens. Lastly, there's Homo erectus sensu stricto, or in a much stricter sense, and these are the guys that are attached to the type specimen in Trinil. So it's Homo erectus sensu stricto if it can be found in like Java, China, kind of that general area of Asia, and if it has another, again, very specific suite of morphologic characteristics. I'm going to go over in excruciating detail why I think these guys deserve to be three separate species, and the consensus tends to be that for sure Homo erectus in sort of its Asian context and Homo ergaster in its African context are probably different species. People tend to be iffy on Homo georgicus, but I think a case can be made for it. Anyways, all of the minutia of the morphologic criteria I'm going to be going over in my Wild Tale of Human Evolution series when we eventually get there, but I want you to be aware of this split because 
Sanford and Root consider all of them to be Homo erectus, and there is a wide, wide range of morphologies present if you do consider all of them to be a single species. An example would be something like brain case size, because the oldest Homo erectus, if you're Sanford and Root, would be those Homo georgica specimens from Georgia, and their brain cases can get as small as in the 500 range, 500 cc range. That is insane. That's Australopith range. Right, Homo sapiens has 1200 to 1400 as our range. So I don't know about that, especially because the average Homo erectus brain case size when we're looking at sort of the younger material from Asia is like a thousand cc's, like nearly double what we see in Georgia. I don't think that you can make a case that that kind of morphologic variation can represent a single hominin species. Anyways, it's important to keep all of this in mind because Contested Bones starts off its Homo erectus chapter by saying, Homo erectus, upright ape man or fully human? Now remember, when they say fully human, human has not been defined yet in this entire Honkin text. We haven't seen a single definition for human. But I digress. Then they take a quote from Michael Day, who's a professor of anatomy at the University of London, who says, does Homo erectus exist as a true taxon or should it be sunk into Homo sapiens? And I wrote 1988 above it because the majority of our Homo erectus material has been found since this date. And in this entire Homo erectus chapter, the reigning theme is going to be its pathology, which is something that they're going to say a lot, and also ancient sources. They say, new species or anatomical variation within Homo sapiens. Now we're going to be talking about this later because I have some lovely studies to bring up for it, but I put to the side here, it depends. Are they outside the range of modern human variation? Because you can't say it's variation with Homo sapiens if you can't show that it is within the modern variation that we see. Can the whole suite of characteristics of ancient Homo erectus, including you know, all of those potential other species, be sampled within a modern group of Homo sapiens, or even including archaic Homo sapiens or not? Uh, the spoiler is that they can't, but we'll get there. <laughs> Certain bones have been classified as Homo erectus. We will usually refer to these bones simply as erectus. So unbearably lazy. Again, they did this with the paleo experts, for those of you who weren't with us for that episode. Sanford and Roop think that the word paleoanthropologist is too long, and so what they have decided to do instead is just call them paleo experts. Homo erectus is not hard to say. Uh, it's very un unprofessional to just write erectus. It's, it's not even in italics. That's bad form, boys. No, no. Meaning upright man. These bones are claimed to represent an extinct transitional form between Australopithecine apes and modern humans and are used as one of the primary arguments for human evolution. Uh, no, they're not. The prime, one of the primary arguments for the human evolution is paleoanthropology in general. So I guess, kind of, but like Homo erectus specifically, like when I'm talking to people, I'm like, hey, creationists, like, have you considered? And then I, I whip out Homo erectus and I just slap it on their desks. I just, I beat them to death with it. <laughs> Joking, in Minecraft, there is now growing evidence that indicates that what has been called erectus is fully human, just as significant number, just as a significant number of paleo experts have always maintained. Erectus is essential to the ape to man story, and so textbooks, museums, TV pro and TV programs still insist that erectus is less than human. Their primary argument is based on the fact that erectus had an atypical skull, then in quotes they put, very similar to Neanderthal. However, unlike Neanderthal, erectus had a reduced brain volume. In addition, some erectus bones indicate reduced body size and pathologies. There is evidence that these traits can best be understood as being a result of reductive selection inbreeding and genetic degeneration. So, couple things here. First and foremost, discussing the fact that there's growing evidence, I'm going to tell you for a fact there isn't, right? I just got out of hominin evolution as a graduate student, as a PhD student. No one thinks right now at all who is living that Homo erectus belongs in Homo sapiens, except maybe Wolpoff, and he is like a million years old. Um, so, Continuing onward, they discuss how <laughs> Homo erectus is only considered to be a separate species because of its atypical skull, um, and then they ignore the postcrania and say it's probably likely, they, they, they go ahead and imply that it's probably likely that the, the um, aberrance of the skull can be chopped up to pathology. 
None of that is true, but of course we will um, get to that later. And then they say a significant number of paleo experts have always maintained that, of course, Erectus deserves to be subsumed into Homo sapiens. Um, this is not true, but I understand why they think it's true, because all of their sources are from the 1980s, when we didn't have very much Homo erectus material, nor did we have any material, or very much material, in between the likes of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, and indeed in between the Australopithecines, we didn't have Ardipithecus, none of the Miocene hominins really, or none of the Miocene apes, and into sort of the early Pliocene hominins, so it's a mess, but they would know that this is not the current state of the field had they not been exclusively, oh, I don't know, plucking sources from the 1980s, almost as if one were going out cherry picking. We, the authors, stand with the paleo experts who lump Homo erectus with Homo sapiens. In our view, they are both erect, they are both intelligent, and they are clearly human. I put still no definition because they're just, they still haven't defined what a human is. Um, and they will not be naming the modern paleo experts that hold that Homo erectus is just clearly human. Again, clearly human is not something that you're really going to find in scientific papers, but I digress. While erectus is clearly human, it is not a normal human. Oh, okay. <laughs> erectus was very much like Neanderthal, but displaying evidence of various pathologies. I'm sure we'll get you know, a hint into what these pathologies are. Many erectus skulls are disturbing, showing diverse abnormalities and asymmetries. It is said that erective skulls have certain, that erective skulls have certain primitive ape-like features. These phenotypic differences seem to have been exaggerated and are not so much primitive as they are degenerate. That's another thing we need to talk about. For those of you who are new here, perhaps some of my colleagues who have since found the YouTube channel, hello everyone. I'm mortally embarrassed. Sanford is a proponent of an idea called genetic entropy. Genetic entropy is the young earth creationist version of a failed idea in regular conventional biology called error catastrophe. There is no evidence for it. So keep that in mind, like degeneration in that, in that form, right? This sort of genetic entropy style degeneration, we don't have any existing support for it. But I've talked about that to death in, in sort of other areas. The fact that they call, I mean, like, really, you have to come after an extinct species like this? You're going to dunk on erectus and call it disturbing? I find it very telling that they say that the features aren't primitive um, when they are precisely what we would expect if Homo sapiens had evolved from a more basal-looking ancestor. But, you know, I digress. They seem to reflect pathology. Even these pathological features fall within the range of variation seen within Homo sapiens. I put no comma source because I have several sources that I'm going to be bringing up that show that no, the more Homo erectus specimens that you include in the sample, and when I'm saying Homo erectus, I mean that sensuleto, so including the specimens we call Homo georgicus and Homo ergaster, the more that we see that they don't fall within human variation and they probably don't even fall within archaic human variation. They are distinct from one another. In this chapter, we will show that hunter-gatherer groups that are subject to inbreeding and reductive selection are prone to developing abnormal skulls. Hmm. Red flag. Hunter-gatherer groups can survive for many generations. Okay, so they go on and on and talk about how um, the reason is because they're in isolated populations and inbreeding is what is resulting in those primitive looking skulls. Inbreeding does not inherently result in sort of this movement backwards towards a more primitive looking organism. That is not how it works. Inbreeding, which is, you know, it's genetic drift, just means that you've got higher prevalence of homoplasy, so less common alleles, including ones that can be detrimental and need to have two, um, need to be homozygous recessive in order to actually express themselves. It's easier for them to do so in small pocketed populations. But many hunter-gatherer groups, especially the ones that exist today, they do interbreed with other like communities, right? They're not that isolated, not in our global world. So that is, that's just wrong demonstrably based off of the hunter-gatherers of today. These are the guys that are always talking about how science can only be done in the present. So you would think that they would have more respect for that. So they continue and talk about how they think that, um, or they say, this evidence supports the interpretation that erectus is more appropriately a variant, and in, or in parentheses, they say a degenerate form of Homo sapiens and is not transitional form between apes and man. So their point that they're saying is that this genetic entropy concept that I told you, again, for those of you who are perhaps new, genetic entropy is something that they invoke to explain why things look the way that they are. 
as opposed to this perfect status that all creatures had in the Garden of Eden. Because remember, these guys are young Earth creationists. So they think after Eve eats the apple and they get booted from, you know, paradise, genetic entropy starts taking place and the bodies just start breaking down over generations, successive generations. Don't ask them how this works for things like bacteria, because bacteria obviously have much shorter generation times than things like humans or elephants or, you know, apes, other apes, non-human apes. Uh, and yet we don't see them undergoing genetic entropy, do we? They are still around. So um, Sinfra's response to this was actually just, uh, they're built different. So again, this is the kind of group of folks that, that we're working with. But if genetic entropy can't be seen in like fast generation organisms, then like it, it's just not, it's not there. We don't see it in any organism um, who, whose generations we're tracking. Okay, so they spent a decent amount of time talking about the background of discovery of Homo erectus. They talk about Eugene Dubois, the churnal specimens. Um, they do an okay job, actually put okay-ish on the side here. Then they say worldwide there have been about 300 erectus finds, most of them consisting of an isolated skull cap and or a few broken bones or teeth. There's no source for this, and I suspect that the number is actually quite a bit higher because that number, that 300-400 number, is usually what we see for australopithecines, um, and we find, or sorry, australopiths, uh, and we find way more Homo erectus. I know that our Homo erectus record is significantly better because they've lived in the more recent past, so they've had less opportunity to be destroyed. So, anyways, and also Homo erectus sensuleto, that in a broad sense, again, including the potentially separate species, it's very long-lived species. So, not long-lived as in individuals, but like it was around for like two million years. That's a long time. So, okay. They say these remains have been found in Indonesia, China, and also Europe, Africa, and possibly India. The African form of Homo erectus is often referred to as Homo ergaster or ergaster. Until very recently, only one nearly complete erectus skeleton had been recovered, which was dubbed Turconoboy. This is uh, okay, I guess. It was found in Kenya in 1984 and is the only Homo erectus or Homo ergaster skeleton where the skull has been found clearly associated with the rest of the body. Before the discovery of Turconoboy, previous erectus remains primarily consisted of isolated broken bones. These individual, these included individual teeth, skull caps, fragments of skulls and jaws, and one intact femur mixed with several uh, broken femurs. Two prominent paleo experts, Ian Tattersall and Jeffrey Schwartz, noted that the general absence of other erectus bones confounded the analysis of the Turconoboy. And then they quote them by saying, although it is truly remarkable how such how so much of a single individual skeleton could be recovered, this amazing find is also presented with a dilemma because Homo erectus or not, most of it could not be compared with anything else closely related to it because the comparable parts weren't known. It's actually, I would imagine, we should go and check this out in a second, but I imagine that this is also because not that we didn't have other members of Homo erectus to compare it to, but because like the Turconoboy is also a juvenile. So it's not that we didn't have other specimens, we didn't have other specimens of an appropriate age to compare it to. Um, and I imagine that that's, that's something that Tattersall and Schwartz kind of talk about. Now that was in 2000, so prior to Diminisi, prior to many of our other Homo erectus finds, again, in that sensuleto sense, but I want to talk briefly about the nature of like finding fossils because the Turconoboy is an excellent specimen, but we have a lot of skulls from Homo erectus and a lot of postcrania from it. Again, in that broad sense, just assume I mean in a broad sense, unless I'm talking about specific specimens, because that's how these guys refer to it. So this individual here is a model recreation of the Peking man. It was done by Tattersall and Schwartz, or excuse me, Tattersall and Sawyer. So one of the individuals who contested bones just mentioned. Um, colloquially, this guy was known as the Peking man. So it's one of those true sensu stricto homo erectus members. And what I want you to appreciate is like, so you look at this guy and you see the portions of the face that were actually recovered in brown. Uh, and you wonder, okay, how can they make the rest of the skull itself? How can they, is it just guesswork? Or are they just filling in the blanks? And the nice thing about humans and hominins and primates in general and all animals, really most animals, is that we're bilaterally symmetrical. Radially symmetric animals like echinoderms and nadarians can found this little butt. That means that if you have one half, you also can reflect it down the midline and get the other half. So for instance, if you have just one half of the brow ridge, that can reflect over. Same thing with the zygomatic over here. We have this piece. We know what the other side looks like because these guys, again, are bilaterally symmetrical. The same is true for the teeth. So for instance, this side of the mandible is more complete than this side. But if you've got one, you just reflect it over and you have the other. And that's how you get most, like a, almost a full completion. Like when you reflect this thing, you've got like 80% or more of the skull. And at that point, there's only so many geometric ways that the middle, that the missing pieces can be reconstructed. For example, like 
uh, the, the bridge of the nose, right? So these nasal bones right here. We're missing it on both sides. But it's not like the bone like went out and did a zigzag and came back, right? That's not structurally a possibility for this thing. So it really narrows things down when you think about you know, bilateral, sym sym bilateral symmetry and how that impacts our reconstructions. And because of that, when they say things like we have a handful of femurs or some ribs, like some postcrania, and like we have a whole lot of skulls and only some of them are associated with, with the postcrania, like that's a lot of material. That's how we know with pretty extreme certainty what these things look like, not just as a whole, but indeed how we know what the potential like species within Homo erectus actually look like as well. So Homo georgicus or Homo ergaster, things like that. Then they say, in terms of age, the earliest erectus remains were dated to about 1.9 million years old. The species is thought to have persisted until 50 to 140,000 years ago, but some studies have suggested that they may lived as recently as 20,000 years ago. So something important here, the quote that they just made from Tattersall is from the year 2000, but that 1.9 date comes from like the, the Georgicus specimens, right? So the ones from Demonisi, who Tattersall didn't know about when he wrote this statement. So keep that in mind. So they have the trinal specimens down here as a picture. Then they say, thus the estimated time where Rectus lived would have spanned roughly two million years, about one third of the six million years during which an ape population would need to evolve into modern man. Seven million years. Thank you very much, say Helentibus chinensis. Description of the basic erectus morphology. So they talk about the type specimen and how, how you know, it belongs to those trinal specimens coming from uh, Java by Eugene Dubois. And then they say, being the first type specimen means the reference point for assessing all other fossils. This is problematic since it is essentially just a skull cap. On the other hand, Turkana boy is the most complete erectus specimen and would arguably make a better choice for the type specimen discussed later. So like, yes, the more complete the type specimen, the better. And I actually tend to agree with the notion that I think is kind of silly that the name has to stay with the type specimens. Like Homo erectus is tied to the trinal stuff, even though it is just a skull cap. I do think that it would be better if we could wait until we have more complete material. But that being said, that's just not how it works. You know, if, if bees and nuts were candies and butts or however the phrase goes. <laughs> Tattersall and Schwartz offer a careful description summarized as follows. This is Homo erectus sensuleto um, description. It has a low brain case with long sloping forehead. The brow ridges are pronounced and continue straight across. For its small size, the skull is fairly elongated. In frontal view, the skull is wide with a slight depression on either side of the midline. Inside view, the rear of the skull known as the occipital region is V-shaped. The cranial capacity is estimated to be approximately 940 cc's, comparatively larger than apes, but overlaps with the lower end of human variation. Generally speaking, these features, large brow ridges, sloping foreheads, and cranial capacities are characteristic for most erectus specimens. In skulls that preserve the face, they typically exhibit marked prognathism, which is, of course, the snoutiness of an animal. They lack a distinct chin. However, it is important to realize that there is considerable variation in the skulls assigned to the species. Leading paleo experts have pointed out that erectus includes highly variable skull types that look significantly different from the trinal type 2 specimen. A figure from a paper recently published in Science 2014 displays the extant, the extant variation in erectus reflecting the ongoing debate within the paleoanthropological paleo community. Note that many erectus skulls appear deformed and asymmetrical even after correcting for post-mortem fossil damage. This is consistent with the idea that these individuals suffered from pathologies. So no, that is not the case. They are not still asymmetrical after you account for the fossilization and paramineralization process. That's, that's not how that works. But they have to slide that in there so they can blame it on pathology later. Now, we're going to talk about that pathology soon, but one thing that they are correct on is like, yeah, their homo erectus sensuleto is really variable. That's why I kind of side with the splitters on this one and saying that, yeah, the, the ones that are the Dimonisi specimens, those are homo georgicus. The ones that are like Turcana boy, that should be uh, homo ergaster, the KNMWT15000. I, I agree with that. Uh, but that being said, these guys look at this variety and they say, see, it's all one species, gotta be diseased. And it's like, yeah, yeah, except there's an entire field called paleopathology, which knows how to diagnose and uh, identify the diagnostic characteristics of pathologic conditions like microcephaly and others which coincidentally is what they're also going to use to pin Homo floresiensis as being just clearly human. 
They continue on to talk a bit about the Dimenisi specimens, which are probably the most problematic for them. And, you know, again, this has to do with the fact that the Dimenisi specimens are like aggressively primitive or basal in their morphology. They are snouty, massive brow ridges, projecting canines in some of them, and itty bitty, teeny tiny little brain cases. These things are barely distinguishable from uh, the likes of Homo habilis, which shares a lot with Australopithecines, which these are Australopith, excuse me, which is why these guys are going to, which is why it's weird that these guys are then going to turn around and be like, Australopiths are clearly just apes, just like my dog is clearly just a canine. <laughs> okay, so they make a quote from uh, uh, David, oh, I always mispronounce his name, Lord Kiponzit, sorry, David, uh, who says, if you found the Dimenisi skulls at isolated sites in Africa, people would probably give them different species names. This is true. Like, the, the variability of the Dimenisi skulls is also intense. Now, the variability still does fall within the variation of modern gorillas, but gorillas are also, like, supremely sexually dimorphic, and it's not thought that the Dimenisi specimens are, like, overtly dimorphic. So, I don't really know. It's possible that what we've got going on there is, uh, you know, more than one species, maybe it's Homo georgicus and something else. I tend to think that probably what's going on is that these guys were just pretty variable um, and that that variability isn't necessarily chalked up to dimorphism. Uh, but they aren't Homo erectus. I really don't think that. So uh, now we get a paragraph where Sanford and Rube poo-poo the anthropological community. Not surprisingly, other paleo experts disagree and insist the skulls be viewed as different species that live side by side because they look too different to be the same species. This type of controversy in the field is common. Like, it's like they've never met anyone in any other biology field, right? Or anyone in paleoanthropology. Like, biology is just rife with people disagreeing with each other because that's how science works. People want to advance their own hypotheses. Uh, the bottom line is that there is no clear-cut criterion for what constitutes erectus morphology. Bold of you to say that when you don't have clear-cut criterion for which you define a human, which is really interesting. Paleontologists have long acknowledged that the morphological boundary between erectus and homo sapiens is arbitrary and not clearly demarcated. As researchers have noted, no longer is homo erectus a clearly definable taxon tempor temporally, morphologically, or even geographically. The allowable extent of this variation is highly subjective and debated among paleo experts. This has led taxonomic ambiguity, led to taxonomic ambiguity, and has opened the door for Australopith, in parentheses, ape skulls to be wrongly interpreted as erectus. There's at least one possible example of this in the Dimenisi site, skull D45,000, or 4500, excuse me. As, however, as we will demonstrate in this chapter, most of the remains attributed to erectus are fully human and should therefore be reclassified as homo sapiens as the lumpers in the field advocate. There is a lot to unpack here. Like, a lot, a lot. First, I think that it's important that I say species are arbitrary in general. It's not that the line between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens is arbitrary, it's the line between any given species is arbitrary. Species, in my opinion, are not real things in the sense that they have some biologically intrinsic property to them. This is what we should expect if evolution is legit. You've got a nice color gradient. And when you pick out colors individually, like let's say you have, you know, blue, green, and red, it's easy to say that these two things are different from one another, that these three things are all different from one another. It becomes hard when you put a whole color gradient up there and you say, hey, where does blue start? Where does green end? Where does red start? Right? And that's what the fossil record is like. It's like plucking individual colors and then pretending like there isn't an underlying color gradient that did exist, it just didn't all fossilize. Uh, so what we should expect then is that the more complete the fossil record grows, the harder it should be to actually draw the line between different hominin species within human evolution. And that's precisely what happened with this quote that they used, number 22, which was uh, in 1986, right? So this is, during, this is after Turconoboy was found, and they're talking about how Homo erectus is not a definable taxon because they classified Turconoboy, which was found in Africa, as Homo erectus, which was traditionally known from Asia at the time. So yeah, once they found something that had even remotely similar characteristics somewhere else, they were like, shoot, how do we define it, right? What, what exactly do, do we use as our criteria? Because this thing has some things that look more like Homo habilis and some things that look more like Homo erectus, right? You can come up with a perfect suite of criteria, but what do you do when something is 50% its, its progenitor and its descendant, right? And it's smack dab in between them, temporally speaking. What do you call it? Do you give it a new name? What about the things in between that individual marker and its descendant? 
Do, does everything get its own species or individual species, right? It's just, it's silly to me. It's helpful in the sense that we can communicate them, but like Sanford and Rupert are just voicing the species problem and then they're pretending that it doesn't apply to every hominid. They're, they're exclusively invoking it in order to make Homo sapiens the same thing uh, as Homo erectus, which one simply cannot say. They're temporally different. They are geographically unique. They are morphologically distinct through time. It's just not an argument that can be made. Okay, and then they continue onward to say already they're poisoning the well and saying Archelopids are apes. Um, and when they say apes, they mean apes as in distinct from humans, which are of course also apes, but they don't think that. And then they say um, that it's happened before that Homo erectus has, Homo erectus material has been wrongly interpreted as being an Archelopid. Okay, guys, that is problematic for you, right? Like if things start looking too transitional, and so transitional, in fact, that you have to write a whole book about, you know, how literally their explanation for Australopithic sediba is that it's a mix of Australopith and human bones, like modern humans and Australopiths. When you have to resort to that, like, there is no perfect, more, perse more perfect transitional. There just isn't, it doesn't get better than that. And like, you're up a creek without a paddle. If your response is to say it's too good, then it's probably time to throw in the towel. Um, and that's what they're saying here, because to my knowledge, no one has no one has found an erectus erectus material, homo erectus material, and attributed it to an australopith. Uh, and then they say that that's probably what's going on with skull D forty five hundred. Okay, that you guys are just saying that though, right? Like that's not the opinion of anybody who's actually working at the site that that skull is an australopith. Some people think that it's more primitive than the others there but no one is saying that it's an Australopith. So you, you see what's going on here, right? It's like selective cherry picking of uh, anthropologic opinions and then sort of the, the mutation of them to fit the creationist narrative. But then those mutated points are not then applied universally to other, pro other areas of their worldview that that point would then become problematic for, right? So they continue. Prominent paleo experts agree. Homo erectus is homo sapiens. That's the title of this, of this section. Uh, and you're really going to get a kick out of this because the ones that they list as agreeing that Homo erectus is Homo sapiens, all of those citations are from the 70s and the 80s. Shocking, I know. Um, I was just, and then at the end, they include a quote from a creationist. They include a quote from the book Bones of Contention, which is like the predecessor to Contested Bones. It's kind of hilarious, but like, I guess they really do think that no one is going to go check where and when their sources come from. So the evolutionary paleo experts known as Lumbards have insisted for decades variation found within erectus specimens overlap extensively with modern humans. On that basis, and they have 23 and 24 as their citations, which is from 1981 and 1973. So those are... Uh, this is the lumpers. On that basis, such lumpers agree that erectus should be grouped with homo sapiens as a single species. Many other paleo experts object to this and claim that erectus exhibits a distinct morphology and merits classification as a separate species. While it is true that homo erectus exhibits some distinctive traits, it does not logically follow that they must therefore be viewed as separate subhuman species. Pause. Then what defines a species, Sanford and Roop? What defines it? Because I, if it's not the morphology, that is a biological species concept, the erectus DNA, Homo erectus DNA, we don't know about. Okay, they continue on. Human skeletons come in many shapes and sizes. In modern populations, distinct traits in the face and cranium serve as recognized people groups. Forensic scientists are able to identify which people group a modern skull belongs to by looking at diagnostic traits. However, no scientist today would claim that the distinctive skull features in modern people groups prove that they belong to a different species. Yeah, duh because there's a certain range of variation that is allowed, right? You have the variation within wolves. Wolves are variable depending on the area of, you know, their, their range that they belong to. Some of them have more robust jaws. Some of them have different pelage colors. Some of them have bigger feet, more webbing between the toes if they have a more marine diet, interestingly enough. Uh, and yet it's very easy to tell the difference between, you know, a, a wolf skull and a coyote skull because there's a range within wolf variation that coyotes fall outside of. That's the problem with Homo erectus. It falls outside of human variation. Duh, humans are variable. Of course we are. All species are. But I do. I would like to point out that their their citation for that is from uh, Chris Stringer's book Lone Survivors, which I have, 
And what he specifically says is, this is not to say that many populations cannot be distinguished at a general level by the prevalence of common and inherited features, and that this is also reflected in traits like cranial and facial shape, which is why forensic scientists can often confidently place this skull back into its parent population through study and measurement. So what they're basically saying is, yeah, like some generalizations can be made. Okay, so they continue. They have a quote from uh, Lasker at Wayne State University, who is described as an internationally known evolutionary paleo expert, which is like the most creationist sentence that you could ever say. Uh, and they, they take a quotation from that says, even if one ignores transitional or otherwise hard to classify specimens and limits concentration or consideration rather to the job and peaking populations, the range of variation within Homo erectus of many features falls within that of modern man. So I put not the whole suite, as my note, right? Because like, yes, molar variation, first molar variation in Homo erectus may fall within the range of Homo sapiens, but you know what doesn't? The cranial capacity combined with the, the skull shape, its platycephalic nature, combined with the prognathism, combined with the angles of the zygomatics, combined with many other different characteristics of it, right? Like the whole suite has to be comparable um, and fall within the Homo sapiens range, which it doesn't. Then they, then they take Wolpoff and they put Wolpoff forward and they use a quote from Wolpoff that is from 1984. And they say other leading experts in the field have raised similar concerns. Uh, they say evolutionary paleo expert Michael Day in the Guide to Fossil Man asks, does Homo erectus exist as a true taxon or should it be sunk into Homo sapiens? This is from 1986. Like they're working with mostly skull cap material in a couple of faces, but they're working with more recent Homo erectus from Asia, so Southeast Asia, Java, and places like that. That's like the most derived form. Okay, so then they continue um, and they quote paleo experts again, um, and then their citation for 30 says, sinking Homo erectus and Homo sapiens would mean simultaneously folding another similar species, such as Homo heidelbergensis, Homo rhodesiensis, Homo antecessor, and Homo ergaster, as well as all other so-called archaic humans. So this is sort of a kill multiple birds with one stone, uh, and the citation is again, from a creationist, which is again, quite funny. So then they talk about the skeleton. They say that the skeleton of Homo erectus is indistinguishable from modern humans. A bold claim, if I do say so myself, uh, and most of the citations come from 1984. How do they keep doing this? It's just really interesting that all of the sources that are saying that Homo erectus is just homo sapiens or should be subsumed into homo sapiens are at or before the discovery of the Turkana boy. How strange, especially since that was in like 1984. Why are we picking such early sources, boys? Could it be perhaps because if we include the entire suite of homo erectus, it would be completely untenable to place it within homo sapiens? I've already transformed into my miniest mode due to what is coming next, but let's read a little bit more. Their next section is titled Erectus Skeleton Indistinguishable from Modern Humans. And they talk about how, boy, how come we aren't finding fossils fast enough? But then all of their sources are again from the 80s, so they, I guess, are just at this point because it's convenient ignoring everything past 1984. Um, they say, this happened with the discovery of the Turkana boy in 1984, referring to the fact that this is the best skeleton that we have. Prior to that time, almost no non-skull postcranial bones were recovered. Just a severely diseased and distorted partial skeleton from Kenya with no analytical value. This is, they describe it as Canem ER 1303, a partial pelvis, one complete femur and other bone fragments, and as Nature reports in the discovery paper detailing the anatomy of the Turkana boy, and then they list uh, a quotation from from that, which says previous Homo erectus postcranial material has either been fragmentary, not definitively associated, disputed as to the species, or diseased. From Trinil, Indonesia, there are several fragmentary and one complete but pathological femur. Despite the fact that it was these specimens that led to the species name, there are doubts as to whether or not they are Homo erectus, with the most recent consensus being that they are probably not. Until only recently, the Homo erectus postcranial bones from China are found in Zukudian. Zukudian, I'm never going to pronounce that right. And these were very fragmentary with no complete lengths or articular joint surfaces. And this is from source 34, which was in 1985. So really good stuff. Then they talk about how uh, other Homo erectus material has been found at Olduvai Gorge and in East Turkana. And then they say that these remains are also equally fragmentary and also diseased. So I want to stop for a moment um, just to note something important. 
there is only one example that talks about a like a diseased homo erectus specimen in the sources that they've listed they've talked about diseased specimens like four times and only once has any of those like claims been sourced and it was one diseased femur from java so why are they talking about diseased specimens from kenya and from uh, other locations. I thought it was kind of interesting too that they discussed K&M ER 1303 being diseased because it turns out when you Google K&M ER 1303, 1303, um, like nothing comes up. <laughs> you can't find anything from it. And when you go to the citation of what they're saying 1303 is, you end up with this paper from 1976 by the leakies and they discuss this is the citation again for that diseased partial skeleton and this is what they say a well-preserved partial innominate a portion of the pelvis and a relatively complete cranium provide further support for the presence of homo during the pleistocene these hominin species and others were collected during 1974 and 1975 in kubi fora the material reported here has been referred to by the upper and lower members of kubi fora formation blah 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 nothing about disease now, I suppose it could be here in table one, but I can't actually get access to this thing because it's a billion years old. But there you have it. You, you would think that a partial skeleton, given they're as rare as contested bones likes to propose, they aren't actually all that rare, but they're certainly rarer than isolated remains. You would think that would be mentioned here, especially since we're talking about K&M ER 3228, which again, 3228 uh, is a portion of the femur, an innominate. Let's see, hold on. Innominate. Hello? Yeah, here it is. I believe. Yeah, there it is. So, uh, but no discussion of that. Very strange, very odd. Uh, let us continue. Wait, can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. Okay. So, they continue to talk again about these diseased uh, remains, but they're not citing anything. And then they say that the only difference between Homo erectus postcrania, so stuff below the skull, uh, is that it's the thickness of the bone. So they talk about, they cite a lot of guys who are saying that, like, Turkana boys unquestionably, unquestionably, excuse me, human from Mariette uh, de Cristana or de Cristina, which like that's fine. But again, and we had this problem earlier in contested bones, Sanford and Roop never put enough of the quotation in there so you know whether or not they're talking about human being a member of genus Homo or human being Homo sapiens. And that's very problematic. So let's see, they continue to talk about um, how, like they quote John Reeder, who says that Homo erectus can't act as like the perfect missing link because it's too similar to humans and not similar enough to other apes. I tend to agree, um, but like if you want your perfect transitional form, like we can just look to Homo habilis, we can look to Australopithecus sediba, we can look to earlier Australopithecines. For bipedality, we can look at Ardipithecus ramidus. For brain case size, we look at the Demonisi hominids. Like there's a transitional for any taste out there. Um, and then they say no paleo expert doubts the overall size and body proportions of the Turkana boy were anatomically modern. Dental evidence and unfused growth plates suggest that he was an adolescent no older than 12 to 13 years of age. At the time of death, he would have stood at 5 feet 3 inches, but had he lived to adulthood, he could have grown to 6 feet tall in height. All of these features demonstrate Turkana boy was fully human from the neck down, and as we will see, this is also true of the skull. It is for this reason that leading experts acknowledge Leading experts acknowledge Homo erectus that it represents the emergence of the modern body. This is a clear admission that erectus is anatomically human. Okay, so that's really important because the first paper that we're going to look at here uh, is titled Rib Cage Anatomy in Homo erectus suggests a recent evolutionary origin of the modern human body shape. And they're actually looking at the Turkana boy, which is the individual, the specimen, KNMWT uh, 15,000. This is the individual that Sanford Group just got done saying that its body plan supports that it's fully human. So <laughs> this says, the tall and narrow body shape of anatomically modern humans evolved in changes in the thorax, pelvis, and limbs. It's debated, however, where they first evolved. And then they say, here we present the first quantitative three-dimensional reconstruction of the thorax of Homo erectus, the, the um, uh, Turkana boy, along with its estimated adult rib cage for comparison with Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Uh, and what they find is 
that it has a short mediolaterally wide and anterior posteriorly deep thorax, which differs considerably from the much shallower thorax of Homo sapiens, pointing to a recent evolutionary origin of the full modern human body shape. The large respiratory capacity of K&M 15000 is compatible with a relatively stocky and more primitive body shape of Homo erectus. So, wrong, right? This is incorrect, boys. Now, this is from 2020, right? Although, I happen to have it on good authority that a second edition of this has come out. I would be eager to see uh, if they note this fact, the, the uniqueness of the postcrania for Homo erectus in there. Now, not only that, but we have to discuss something called life history, because what they what they also say is that it's the dental evidence and unfused growth place. They imply heavily that the Turkana boy, Can MWT uh, 15,000, has a life history that's very similar to modern humans. In fact, indistinguishable and uh, definitively are the words that they continually use. And I think it's important to talk about life history because life history is one of the things that makes Homo sapiens unique from all other hominins, and there aren't very many things that do, so it's important to pay attention to these. So this chapter from um, uh, a, a text, a textbook on genus Homo by Dean and Smith in 2009 discusses the growth and development of the Inarikotomi youth, KNMWT 15,000, again, Turkana boy. So, they talk about the Turkana boy's maturation, and basically what they do is they look at the growth plates, so the epiphyseal plate closures, and the rate of the eruption of the teeth to determine what kind of growth pattern this individual had, whether it's human or whether it is more primitive. And they do this by taking a whole lot of different measurements. I, I like this picture here because it really demonstrates just how like relatively prognathic the Narikotomi boy or the Turkana boy really is. Look at this jutting face. Um, and if we continue downward to the end, talk about body mass estimates, the dental age versus the skeletal age, and all the way down, if we keep going to the conclusion, again, like creationists like to pretend like paleoanthropology is just eyeballing it, but all of this is backed by statistical tests. It has to be. So what they conclude here is this. To us, the most parsimonious explanation for this combination of facts is that the growth curve of early Homo erectus was more like that of modern chimpanzees. More specifically, whereas the precise growth curve of Homo erectus was likely unique, it apparently differed from ours in the direction of chimps. If anything, this review combined with data emerging from dental microanatomy provides increasing support for the model proposed by Smith, in which early Homo erectus is predicted on average to erupt M1, or the first molar around 4.5 years, the second molar around 9, and the third around 14. 0.5, so we erupt ours at like 18, <laughs> that last one, with a late childhood lacking a slowdown in growth and a lifespan proportionally somewhat, or proportionally 15 years longer than a modern chimp. Most recent ideas uh, around, uh, they just talk about all this stuff. So they think that the Nariokotomi boy uh, is an early adolescent at the age of eight or nine and may have been independent at 12 or 13. Um, so basically they grow up faster than we do, which is a more primitive trait. So it does not have a totally derived postcrania. It does not have a derived growth rate. Uh, and to be clear here, the reason that they that they um, compared the epiphyseal plates versus the dental stuff is that you get different results. It's like 11-ish if you use the epiphyseal plate closure, um, and it's younger if you use the dental closure. But it turns out this is only the case if you're using estimations on human growth rates, which was actually, as it turned out, not appropriate. So. These are all important things to keep in mind because it's like, again, it's the, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of what Sanford and Rupert are claiming. And since this was in 2009, there's no excuse. They can't blame it on this book having come out afterwards. This they should have known. Um, so then they continue and they, uh, there's quotes in here that are kind of dicey, um, but they give this quote. If paleo experts openly acknowledge that erectus exhibited a postcranial anatomy almost identical to modern humans, on what grounds can they insist it was a subhuman species? They like to use this term subhuman a lot. Um, I think it's really silly, but the reason that they use it is very clear. They want to make it seem like it's a supremacy thing for modern Homo sapiens. Modern Homo sapiens is not better than hominins that came before. We are derived in some portions of our anatomy, but so are other hominins. Homo naledi has traits that humans don't have that aren't primitive. They're unique to Homo naledi. Same with Neanderthals, same with Denisovans. They have their own unique paths that we took. No one is better or worse because of it. They're just unique.
Contested Bones goes on to take issue with arguments put forward by McLaren and Hewitt, who say that because the Turconoboy had narrower thoracic vertebral canals, uh, that it's also, like, deserving of its own species because of that. Uh, and, like, Contested Bones just poops its pants over it. They say, in suggesting this, researchers are trying to find a possible reason to downgrade Homo erectus into a subhuman species. Some paleo experts refuse to accept erectus as being human. In seeking to demote erectus, there seems to have been a tendency to rely on minutia, such as the exact size of the vertebral canal. Realistically, there is no way to tell if a slightly narrowed vertebral canal would affect speech. Alabin, expert in spinal anatomy and pathology from Tel Aviv University, does not believe the Turconoboy would have had any difficulty breathing because of a small vertebral canal. Um, like, difficulty breathing is not the same thing as controlled breathing, which was one of the arguments made by McLaren and Hewitt, but more importantly, like, the language that's used here is very strange. Demote. Downgrade. Again, trying to emphasize that <laughs> paleoanthropologists are trying to somehow make Homo erectus worse. Uh, and this is because to, to Sanford and Roop, there always has to be an agenda. Science can't just be science. And that's because they have an agenda here, right? They're pushing their ideology, not based off of any work that they have done independently in paleoanthropology, because neither of them are paleoanthropologists. They're just trying to take, to cherry pick issues that they see other paleoanthropologists having with the, the minutia of other hypotheses and using it to present this case that the whole field is just garbage. Um, and again, like they just have a complete misunderstanding of what the field is and how it operates, understandably, because they're not in it. Um, but again, they, they go on to basically say, so what? So what if, uh, if, if the Turconoboy uh, uh, CanMWT 15,000 has different anatomical minutiae? As we already discussed, there are many aspects of the Turconoboy postcranially speaking and Homo erectus in general, Sensuleto, that make it unique from Homo sapiens, and most of them weren't discussed in here, but this is another another aspect. And they, they're critical of the minutia. They're like, why are they using the minutia to distinguish species? Because that's what we do. That's what we do today, whether we're doing it with birds or amphibians or canids, that's how we define species. Because it's easy to look at uh, the characteristics that you know, make a eukaryote versus a prokaryote, right? Like eukaryotes have a, a, a cell, they're a cell with a nucleus. And that's like a, the main thing that defines a eukaryote. There's like 600 billion things that define Canis lupus, right? Because it has to distinguish itself from all of the other members of its family, of Canidae, of its genus, Canis, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, as you, as you specialize, as you further, um, get get as you further get more specific in the kingdom phylum class or the, the Linnaean taxonomy you have to have more characteristics in order to differentiate between organisms that's how it works Sanford and Rupert are mad about it sky is blue grass is green what else is new um so then they say they they cite a surgeon for this too which I think is quite silly uh, and then they go on to say, if this is the level of minutiae that defines whether a specimen is human or subhuman, then one has no choice but to relegate many modern humans to a subhuman species as well. I put absolutely no. They say, this would include bones belonging to Native American Indians. Hmm. Kind of weird of you to say that, Sanford and Roop, because, again... Modern human variation, whether you're looking at individuals who have historically been debased by saying that primitive characteristics like a more prominent brow ridge or whatever, right, because it's Europeans who are who are favoritizing or rather prioritizing and playing favorites with uh, their phenotype, right, still, even then, all of the modern human diversity is like 99.9% nine similar to one another genomically, and all of that morphologic diversity fits within a frame that Homo erectus does not fall into, right? That's a problem. You, you can't just, you can't just accuse paleoanthropologists of like being racist after having not done any of this, of this literature search, you know? Sanford told Roop that this was like the equivalent of work of a PhD and like you would fail for not mentioning any genetics for or like comparative analyses of living humans um, with regard to like what constitutes intraspecific variation versus interspecific variation. Uh, and this is like well understood. There is no race that exists in humans today and like race is kind of a dumb thing anyways, it doesn't really work 
for this reason specifically, no race falls outside the human variation, the modern human variation. Um, so, the evolutionary anatomist Owen Lovejoy has acknowledged that it is easy to make this mistake. In a 1,000 year old North American burial site containing Native American skeletal remains, Lovejoy observed many features that seemed to exceed the normal range of human variation. And this citation is from 1981. So, I will just leave you to ponder that. Then they say erectus skull morphology found in modern humans. They say the most distinctive features of Homo erectus, and I'm saying Homo erectus because again they're just saying erectus, are seen in the skull. They are identified upon based upon a smaller brain case, a heavier brow ridge, sloping forehead, reduced chin, more constrained temples, larger teeth, a more forwardly projecting jaw, etc. These characteristics are commonly discussed as if they are unique to erectus as a species. The evolutionary justification for the establishment of Homo erectus on a, as a subhuman species is built around the assumption that the same traits are not found in modern humans. However, there are a number of modern examples of human skulls exhibiting classic erectus features that discredit this assumption, such as post-erectus post archaic humans from East Asia and Australia. And the citations come from 1986, 1984, and 2000. Um, and the 2000 was talking about Java Man, which was a member of Homo erectus. So I suspect we're comparing Homo erectus to, to Homo erectus in that one. But more importantly, you can find traits in modern humans that are considered more quote unquote privil or primitive, excuse me. What you can't find is the suite of traits that defines Homo erectus in any one given human. One trait is never and has never been enough to define an entire species. It just isn't, right? It's, it's like suites of traits that together combine to define a species. They're, they're apomorphies if it's something derived, right? So let's find out uh, which traits we're going to discuss here. So first they start talking uh, about the Zika virus. <laughs> I kid you not, this whole section here is talking about microcephaly, and they're blaming the small-brained Homo erectus species, Homo erectus sensuleto, um, on having microcephalic skulls. They're going to do the same thing with Homo floresiensis. They're basically saying um, it's too transitional, brain cases too strongly represent the slow gradient of change, uh, over geologic time. Therefore, the ones that have small brain cases that bridge between the Australopithecines, or excuse me, Australopiths, uh, and uh, later members of genus Homo, it's pathologic, it's microcephaly. This is going to blow your mind, but the field of paleopathology has diagnostic characteristics for identifying microcephaly in the fossil record, and no fossil hominin, including Homo floresiensis, fits the bill. That means you can't blame it on microcephaly because microcephaly presents in diagnosable ways in not just Homo sapiens, but other living hominids. So that doesn't work, you guys. We'll be talking more about this later, but this is a perfect example. This is a paper discussing Homo floresiensis titled Microcephalic Pygmoid Australopithecus or HOMO. And what they did is they basically assess a bunch of different hypotheses regarding the uh, Liang Bua um, hominin Homo floresiensis, and they compare Homo floresiensis, uh, its cranial and postcranial metrics, uh, with early Homo, two microcephalic humans, a pygmoid, quote unquote, excavated from another cave on Flores, Homo sapiens, including like quote unquote pygmy humans. Um, Australopithecus and Paranthropus. And then they say, based on these comparisons, we conclude it is unlikely that LB1 is a microcephalic human and it cannot be attributed to any known species. Its attribution to a new species, Homo floresiensis, is supported. There's diagnostic characteristics for this, guys. Like, you can't just say it's small, so it's microcephaly. And they even say in here, they say, Microcephaly can produce constricted temples, pragmatism, pronounced brow ridges, abnormally small brain cases, and a V-shaped occipital region features commonly seen in Homo erectus skulls. It is possible some examples of Homo erectus could have arisen in a similar way. Oh, is it? Because here's some examples of microcephalic skulls. Do these microcephalic skulls have the suite of characteristics that define Homo erectus? Do they have the impressive brow ridge? Do they have the prognathism? Do they have the platycephalic skull? They might have one of these traits, right? Like this individual here seems to have some subnasal, um, or rather alveolar prognathism, right? And some of them have weird shapes, 
but none of them have the entire suite of characteristics that diagnoses a healthy member of homo erectus. Not one single one does. It's just, it just doesn't work. And the worst part about it is like, there's not even citations here for the microcephaly stuff. There's just mentions of it. It's lazy and it's frankly, it's, it's frankly lazy in like, it feels like it's lazy in an intentional way. After the microcephaly stuff, they, in a way that kind of feels like they know it was a bad argument, go healthy modern humans can also display erectus like features. Uh, Ram Pasasa pygmies from the island of Flores are prone to prognathism and a receding chin. They are not prone to a receding chin. A receding chin implies that there is no bony protuberance at all. None of them have the lack of the protuberance. They just have, for seemingly from, uh, from a non-skeletal perspective, a weak chin. A weak chin and an absent chin are not the same thing, um, especially skeletally speaking. Being prognathic, like, but prognathism seen in the rage of modern humans is nothing compared to what we see uh, in Homo erectus. I, don't, I should just keep it down. I don't know why I keep putting it back up. So compare these two individuals, right? You have Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. Their prognathism is not equivalent, right? The presence of a chin in Homo sapiens is that bony protuberance there. Homo erectus lacks it entirely. There's no chin, nothing even close. You don't see this in extant populations of humans, um, unless they're pathologic, which interestingly enough, you can diagnose in multiple different ways. And no members of Homo erectus that I know of have those characteristics alongside their suite of Homo erectus uh, defining traits. So then they say, uh, anthropologist William Lawlin of the University of Connecticut made note of these similarities in the journal Science. He concluded that in the light of intense variation found in the human form, Homo erectus should be included within a single species, Homo sapiens. Here's the quote. When we find that significant differences have developed over a short time span between closely related contiguous peoples, such as in Alaska and Greenland, and when we consider the vast differences that exist between remote groups, such as Eskimos and Bushmen, who are known to belong to the single species of Homo sapiens, it seems justifiable to conclude that Sinanthropus, later renamed to Homo erectus, in parentheses by these guys, uh, belongs to the same diverse species. So the fact that it calls Homo erectus Sinanthropus should be your alarm bell going off because that quote is from 1963 and i put 1963 moron because it's so ridiculous like we didn't have any homo erectus specimens other than a handful of skull caps from java and maybe some african material but not much leading proponents of the multi-regional continuity model have noted striking similarities between erectus skulls and those belonging to Australian Homo sapiens who lived there in the relative past. This has been reported in the journal Nature, uh, and then they put the citation for that, um, which is from 1972. So again, prior to the Turkana boy, prior to anything other than really kind of bad fragmentary remains and distorted crania that you know have not been subject to the modern ability to reconstruct in things like CT scanners, uh, and then they continue moving onward. Next, they talk about a group called the Cow Swamp People, K-O-W Swamp Specimens, and they note that these specimens look a lot like Homo erectus, even though they are considered Homo sapiens. Show that to you there. But I don't think that their conclusion, which is that the Cow Swamp individuals must have thus interbred with Homo erectus, is necessarily airtight. And my reason for this is one, because I think the biological species concept is stupid anyways. Here's your friendly reminder that species are uh, bogus. But more importantly, like Aboriginal individuals have had their genomes sequenced. The cow swamp people are from Australia. And we don't see any like super archaic genes hanging around in them, which we would expect if they had been interbreeding with Homo erectus as recently as I believe it was 17,000 years that they proposed for these things. But in my search to educate myself on this particular issue, I found this lovely Talk Origins uh, post. For those of you who don't know, Talk Origins used to be the, it's like the old guard of people who've done the creation evolution discussion. Anyways, so uh, the author of this blog reached out to specifically 
uh, an Australian paleoanthropologist and one of the few people who have worked with the cow swamp skulls and other Australian fossils. Uh, and they basically asked him to claim, like asked him to comment on the claim that robust Aboriginal fossils could be reclassified as Homo erectus. Um, and to that end, as we'll see, could it be that they've interbred with Homo erectus and are thus showing the results of that? Um, and he says, <laughs> I've not bothered to discuss the issue of whether Homo erectus is deformed or not, as from a biological perspective, it is so obvious that they are not. For example, while the cow swamp, kubul, and nakuri crania have flattened frontal bones with cranial vaults that are high, unlike Homo erectus, particularly those which are deformed, the Bayesian not preserved, uh, at the cow swamp, but the mean Bayesian bregma at Kabul is 141 millimeters range, 136, sorry, 134 to 153. The curvature of the parietals, particularly those that are deformed, is much greater than in Homo erectus, and the occipitals uh, are of modern Aboriginal morphology and not sharply angled at the torus like in Homo erectus. Maximum cranial breadth is found high on the parietals, and the supraorbital region is nothing like Homo erectus, particularly laterally. The bone in the basal part of the vault is not thickened, etc., etc., so it doesn't have any of these Homo erectus traits. It's got Homo sapiens traits, thin cranial vault, um, stuff like that. And you'll notice, too, they don't include the mandibles here, so you can't see if it's got a chin. All of the features which distinguish modern Aboriginal crania from Homo erectus work with terminal Pleistocene Australian crania as well. Just happens that the late Pleistocene Australians were about 8% larger and more robust than their contemporaries, and a few of them had their heads deformed. So how do they know that the heads are deformed, you might ask? Because paleopathology is a field, and they don't just throw it out there when it's convenient. Interestingly enough, the uh, response from our friend Dr. Brown here continues onward to go through every single Homo erectus trait that's been proposed to be found in the Cowswamp people. Uh, and when you get down to the bottom, you find the mention of no chin, which, again, I just said, there's there's no chin pictured here, and I think that's quite strange. Uh, and then he notes that they do have chins, it's just not as prominent as in Europeans. Uh, this is what you would expect with larger teeth and greater alveolar development. So it kind of makes sense why they wouldn't include the chin here, doesn't it? Uh, but I'll put this link in the description along with the papers um, for ease of fact checking. I will note that it's very funny that <laughs> Sanford and Roop take a quote from the researchers of some of the cow swamp individuals um, who say such conditions would have forced indigenous populations to survive in small groups. The robust skeletal form of the cow swamp people probably arose from an increasing physical and hence genetic isolation um, accentuated by the severity of the last glacial maximum. So they're basically like, yeah, like sometimes you can get primitive traits in individuals, um, not all aligned with erectus, but you can get primitive looking traits. And Sanford and Roop, who made this argument earlier in this chapter, say, the story doesn't seem persuasive and appears to be one more attempt to sweep aside the problem. Uh, and then they put a source 71 and it's, again, it's from that creationist who wrote Bones of Contention. So just excellent, totally superb. Now we get to talk about brain case size. So here's what they have to say about that. They say erectus size overlaps with that of modern humans. And I put Dimenisi. And the reason that this is interesting is because if they want to argue that the brain case of all Homo erectus sensolato overlaps with Homo sapiens, then they also have to concede that Australopith brain case size overlaps with Homo sapiens, all right? Because some of these Dimenisi's like skulls, itty bitty teeny tiny brain case sizes. And I'm excited to talk about it. Let me pull up uh, pull up some of our uh, little sources here. Talk about them Nisi. They say, the reduced cranial capacity found among erectus skulls is often cited as evidence that they were our subhuman ancestors. It is generally believed that before we evolved into modern homo sapiens, we had smaller brains and significantly reduced intelligence. The volumes of ape brain cases tend to fall in the range of 390 to 540 cubic centimeters, while male gorillas being at the upper end of the spectrum. Normal human brain case volumes vary greatly, ranging from 800 to 2220 with the average around 1345 cc's. Erectus cranial capacities are on average 940 cc's with a range anywhere between 700 to 1400. Turkana boy is 880, but could have reached 1000 cc's in adulthood. Uh, and they just continue to like list various individuals. Then they take a quote from uh, John Allen. And let me find out when this is from, 78, 2009, that's okay. 
who says, finally, there's homo erectus, which spans a considerable period of time and wide range of cranial capacities. Even after removing homo ergaster and homo heidelbergensis, homo erectus cranial capacities range from a low end of 727 for OH12 to over 1200 for the largest Chinese specimens. Um, and then we start to move into discussing some of the, let me make sure we're not, okay, some of the uh, small brained humans that they know of. Specifically, actually, I want to go ahead and talk about this. So basically, they <laughs> they give us this winner right here. Does small brains mean less intelligence? Erectus was typically smaller than an average human today, so they would naturally have a smaller brain. The average woman has a smaller brain when compared to men, but this reflects overall body size and does not mean women are less intelligent. <laughs> Not necessarily, right, St. Bruno? Right? Neanderthals had larger brains than the average human. Um, and then they go on to talk about how there are living humans that had small brains. They talk about uh, Anatole France, who is the winner of the 1921 Nobel Prize for Literature. And they say his cranial capacity was 933 cc's. Uh, and then they say a man named Daniel Lyon had a cranial capacity of 660 cc's, but lived a normal life and uh, had like relative okay intelligence they he said they they say that the uh the folks who documented in the late 19 or sorry they say that the folks who documented it in the late 1800s said that he had no sign of mental deficiency uh, and then they say these examples and others doc demonstrate that brain's case size should not be used to support the evolutionary assumption that erectus was a subhuman species uh, and then the source for that railway man uh, is a creationist source in fact specifically it comes, it's titled Turkana Boy, Getting Past the Propaganda and can be found at a creation.com. So let's discuss some of these. I think it's important. First and foremost, the Demonisi skulls are these guys here. These dudes are classified as Homo erectus sensulato. So I think they're Homo georgicus, but some people, most people, I would say it's the consensus that they fall into the Homo erectus range. Um, I think that's not great, honestly, because their cranial capacity ranges so greatly. Again, some of these guys are ranging in the 500s, and some of them are getting up into greater numbers than that. Pull out my notes here from my hominin evolution class and see exactly where some of these guys fall, because I think it's important to have the specific numbers here. Let's see, life history, diets, biogeography. Ergaster and Georgicus. So, this individual, skull number one, has a cranial capacity of 775 cc's. Remember, humans, 1200 to 1400 average, or range. Uh, skull two has 650, then 600, then 625, and lastly, 546. We have Australopiths that are greater than that, which is probably why they say that this thing should be uh, an australopithecine because it's inconvenient for them. But by and large, they have very similar uh, morphologies just to different degrees. Now, you might look at these and say, why are they considered homo erectus if the brain case is so small and the morphology is so primitive? Uh, and it is indeed quite primitive. If you go to the Primitive Brain of Early Homo, a paper released in 2021, uh, they specifically look at the Demonisi hominins and they note that unlike Asian Homo erectus, the Demonisi specimens have an ape-like brain organization. Here we show that the brains of early Homo from Africa West and West Asia retained a primitive great ape-like organization of the frontal lobe. By contrast, African Homo erectus, or right, African early Homo, younger than 1.5 million years, so that would be Homo ergaster, as well as Southeast Asian Homo erectus exhibited a more derived human-like brain organization. Um, frontal lobe reorganization once considered a hallmark of early Homo in Africa, thus evolved comparatively late and long after Homo first dispersed from Africa. So, great ape brain organization is present in the guys that contested bones are considering Homo sapiens. They don't even have a Homo sapiens brain organization, let alone a brain case size. So the brains are small and they're organized like a chimp. Uh, in fact, they, they take this to the next level. They do, I think they did a principal component analysis here. Um, taxonomic implications. I want neurofunctional implications. In modern human brains, the inferior frontal lobe is an important neurofunctional substrate for advanced social cognition, tool making, tool use, and articulated language. We may thus ask the question whether it is evolutionary reorganization around 1.7 to 1.5, uh, which was accompanied by major changes in technocultural performance. The earliest evidence for mode 2, two or Acheulean technocultures uh, in Africa is around 1.76, which largely coincides with the incipient frontal lobe reorganization. 
mode one and two lithic technology, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, and then they say, on the other hand, the cerebral innovations that characterize HOMO at 1.5 may have constituted the foundations for language ready brains for early or for later Homo species, which this creates an interesting problem for contested bones' argument that Homo erectus just did speak. <laughs> Uh, so what they note here uh, is that it seems the data on brain structural variation presented here provide additional evidence for diversity in early homo in Africa. However, the pattern of cerebral structure diversity, structural diversity, does not match the pattern of nathic diversity, such as the question of taxonomic diversity in early homo remains unresolved. Deciphering evolutionary processes in early homo remains a challenge that will not or that will be met, excuse me, only by the recovery of expanded fossil samples and well-controlled chronological context. So the point that they're making here is that we've got a great diversity of um, brain case size and craniodental features uh, in early Homo, which includes the Dominici specimens, which contested bones considers <laughs> Homo erectus. We infer from this that the endocasts of early Homo predating frontal lobe organization potentially exhibit imprints for remnant ape-like lunate sulci in the pari or parido, excuse me, parido occipital region. And then they talk about how additional fossil and archaeological evidence will be required in order to assess whether the earliest populations of Homo uh, outside Africa merged with and were replaced by populations exhibiting the derived morphology. So there may have been interbreeding or it may have been uh, population replacement. So they say that this primitive uh, formation or primitive organization is present in Dominici, but not to the same extent in the uh, Asian Homo erectus fossils. So nobody is exhibiting atomically modern Homo sapiens brains in Homo erectus. That's just what we're seeing. And not only that, but their locomotion is also not identical, um, although it is more similar than what we see with the brain case size and organization. In fact, those Dimenisi hominins are quite transitional. <laughs> Using comparative data from modern humans, chimps, gorillas, as well as other fossil hominins, we show that the Dimenisi hind limb was functionally similar to modern humans with longitudinal, plant, with longitudinal plantar arch, um, increased limb length, and human-like ankle morphology. Other aspects of the foot, specifically metatarsal morphology and tibial torsion, are less derived and similar to earlier hominins. So again, it's a transition, baby! We gotta talk briefly about those humans, those extant humans with small brains too. Um, I'm not going to touch the Daniel Lyons one, the guy that supposedly had like a 680cc brain case size. I just don't really believe it, to be quite honest. I tried to look it up and, you know, again, it was like a newspaper clipping from the 1800s. So I'm not really sure, late 1800s to be clear, but 1800s nonetheless. So I really am skeptical of it. But that being said, if that is the case, it doesn't really matter because his brain case organization or his brain organization was modern. And clearly that's part of the picture, given the Dominici hominins and indeed later members of Homo erectus didn't have that organization. They had an ape-like, great ape-like uh, organization, non-human great ape-like organization. So, but I did went ahead and checked out, I did go ahead and check out the um, the brain of Anatole France, and Sir Arthur Keith is actually the, uh, the guy on it, and he is like a paleoanthropologist guy one of the first, actually. He was a big fan of the Piltdown Man, interestingly enough. But it does seem like they got the numbers wrong. Sanford and Rube got the numbers wrong. It's looking like it was uh, 1,017 grams, which, if memory serves, that's 1,017 cc's, which is not the same thing as 900 cc's or whatever they said in the 900s. This is well within the range of modern humans. So, continuing onward, I would like to talk a little bit about variation. Because all of these arguments that they've been making in, in, in Contested Bones in the, in the Homo erectus section have been surrounding this idea that Homo erectus should be subsumed into Homo sapiens because Homo sapiens can exhibit the range seen in Homo erectus. Um, and again, it's problematic because they're always talking about like a single trait instead of the suite of traits. You're not going to find a single modern human with the whole suite of traits of Homo erectus, and it's pretty hard to find any one human with one trait, to be clear. Um, but I do like this paper because I know one of the authors. I know Claire Terhune. So this is titled Variation and Diversity in Homo erectus, a 3D geometric morphometric analysis of the temporal bone. And what they did is they included a whole lot of Homo erectus specimens as well as, this is for you, Sanford and Roop, anatomically modern humans and chimps and bonobos and gorillas. 
Um, so we should be able to see and orangutan. So we should be able to see quite well if Homo erectus falls outside the range of humans. And in fact, when you come down here, they do. The triangles are Homo sapiens. The squares are uh, fossil specimens of Homo erectus. And indeed, the majority of them aren't overlapping with Homo sapiens. Some of them do. This is what we would expect if this thing is transitional. There should be some derived traits in some members of Homo erectus, uh, but they shouldn't be present in all of them. And that's precisely what we see. Um, in fact, they shouldn't be present in most of them, which is precisely what we see. And then over here we have gorillas and tannins and uh, orangutans and things like that. If you scroll down to the conclusion, because there's a whole lot of methodology in here, you get this. The research presented here indicates the variation within the temporal bone morphology of Homo erectus tends to be greater than that observed in extant hominid species. So the range in Homo erectus is greater than in humans, it's greater than in gorillas, it's greater than in chimps, it's greater than in orangutans. It's uniquely great, which is why they note that the differences between Homo erectus and Homo ergaster are statistically significant and are greater differences and are greater than differences between geographically distinct human populations or subspecies of ape. So what they end up saying here, if I can go ahead and find it, the, whole, the total range of variation cannot easily be partitioned into previously suggested taxonomic, geographic, chronological grouping of specimens. Instead, it seems likely that geographic and temporal factors combine to create a pattern of population differentiation and variation that is difficult to interpret within the context of extant hominins. But they do kind of, they're okay with the concept of Homo ergaster, which is interesting. And then we got another one, which talks about the taxonomic implications of cranial shape variation. So Terhune's paper discussed specifically uh, temporal bone and associated structure variation, but this one includes the entire cranial shape. Uh, and just like Terhune's paper, they include a whole bunch of different specimens, including lots of different members of Homo erectus, including the Demonices and modern Homo sapiens. And they even include papuines, so things like gelatas and baboons. Down in the results section, you get uh, a response to Wolpoff, who was quoted in the 80s by uh, Sanford and Roop as saying that um, Homo erectus should be subsumed into Homo sapiens. And we get this. If, on the other hand, the phylogenetic species concept is applied and two species are recognized, then this study supports a strictly geographic criterion for species division that does not combine OH9 and the Asian specimens into the same species. So it's discussing uh, whether or not we should have ergaster and erectus. Homo erectus and recent Homo sapiens are very distinct in their overall neurocranial shape. And combining these two into a single evolutionary species, and then they cite a bunch of guys from the... <laughs> from the 80s, uh, 90s, and 2000 in the case of hawks, would greatly increase the variation over the level seen in Homo erectus alone. As the current, more restricted Homo erectus sample is already comparable in magnitude to the variation seen in several neontological species, it seems probable that a temporarily expanded Homo sapiens species, including Homo erectus and other Homo taxa, would then be considerably more variable than one single species of the reference taxa. This study therefore does not lend support to the interpretation of Homo sapiens as a single evolutionary species spanning 1.8 million years. So there you have it folks. In, in a study that looked at landmark geometric morphometric variation of the entire skull, they found that if you included Homo erectus into Homo sapiens, the variation would be above anything we have ever seen uh, and thus there is absolutely zero support for it. The last thing that they really discuss as usual with members of the humankind is going to be uh, aspects of culture. So they call it the impressive cultural inventory of Homo erectus. Uh, and then they say that they get mad that people are doubtful of whether or not Homo erectus sailed. Um, and part of the reason is because they point to how Homo erectus could have gotten to the island of Flores and they're like, see, it would have had to sail there. And to that I say, Stegodons got there. Stegodons are dwarf elephants, and they certainly didn't sail there. So, and they got there before there was a land bridge, or rather, well after there had ever been a land bridge. So they go on and list a whole bunch of different things that they say are associated with Homo erectus, some of which are true and some of which have no support uh, or, or completely, completely have no evidence for in either direction, including watercraft assembly, language, reasoning, forethought, planning, and ingenuity, all of those things, no, that none of that works. Bead and pendant manufacture and necklaces, that's speculative. Cordage and not making speculative, although we can assign both of those two things to Neanderthals. The manufacture of diverse stone and bone implements, that is true. Controlled fire, that is true. Catching, skinning, and cleaning fish, cooking food, occupational spaces, 
all of that is true. Petroglyphs, figurines, and art. Nope. Woodworking. Nope. Coordinated hunting. Probably. Butchering, skinning, and transporting large game. Almost definitely. Manufacturing clothing from skins and possibly sewing. No, we don't have any support for that. Production of fibers and resins. No. <laughs> Kinship and family structure, every ape has that, uh, and care for old and weak individuals, um, no, not that I am aware of. There's a little talk of genetic entropy, which again, I've done to death in other videos. There's no support for genetic entropy. I'll put some links in the description where you can learn more about why it's bogus. And then we get the conclusion. Erectus was fully human. <laughs> yes, even the Demonisi specimens with their 550cc brain case size. There is very strong evidence that the bones commonly referred to as Homo erectus are fully human individuals who suffered from various pathologies associated with things such as inbreeding, mutation, teratogens, um, tera teratogens? Developmental abnormalities, etc. No, I just put no. There is not evidence for any of that. They didn't describe a single pathology except for asserting it and referencing the one pathologic femur from Java, which is great. Uh, it is clear that claims that Erectus was a subhuman species are contested among leading evolutionary paleo experts. No, they are. Not since the 80s. While some insist Erectus was morphologically distinct from modern man, others point out that Erectus morphology overlaps extensively with modern humans, and so Erectus should be reclassified as Homo sapiens. Again, just Wolpoth and in the 80s. <laughs> and we just showed that that is not the case definitively when we look at the suites of morphology. We'll get... Hold on. While they claim that, while some claim they were our progenitors, others acknowledge that they coexisted and interbred with anatomically modern Homo sapiens. We probably did coexist. There is exactly to present goose egg support that interbreeding occurred. It may have, but we don't have support for it. And so you can't go around saying that it happened indiscriminately like this. Their sources are 105 and 106 um, from the year 2011 and 2006 both before the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome, if memory serves, which is, again, concerning, <laughs> the fact that, uh, anyways. Um, okay, so, while uh, others would attribute the, okay, while some attribute the differences in skull shape of erectus and modern man to progressive evolution, others would attribute the erectus skull morphology to multiple factors, including reductive evolution. I put, who? Who is doing that? It's just you guys. It's only the creationists who are calling it reductive evolution. I mean, we're not even considering the fact that these things are chronologically completely afar and away from one another. Erectus appears early. If we're calling it Erectus sensuleto, you know, roughly two-ish million years ago, 1.9 million years ago. Anatomically modern Homo sapiens, sorry, anatomically archaic Homo sapiens doesn't appear until 300,000 years ago. They were not contemporaneous for the majority of Homo erectus's tenure on this planet. So we're not even considering that fact. I haven't even butchered them with radiometric dating yet, but one day we'll get there. Okay, the ability of erectus to sail eh, and speak human languages and blah, 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 use fire, do art, all that stuff, reveals a human mind and a soul. Just throw the whole book out. Moreover, the overall morphology of erectus overlaps extensively with modern humans as paleoanthropologists freely confess. They love to use these kinds of words. But again, we just showed that it doesn't. <laughs> with multiple papers, we just went through how it does not. The erectus postcranial skeleton is indistinguishable from that of modern Homo sapiens, aside from subtle differences detectable only through the eyes of a trained anatomist. Oh, okay, so they're different. <laughs> Indeed, most of the classic features attributed to erectus, including those found in the skull and face, have been found in modern humans. Some of them have been found in isolation. So you might have a group of people with larger than normal brow ridge that might dip into the erectus range, but then they lack the rest of the uh, homo erectus suite of characteristics. So, no. <laughs> Um, for all these reasons, evolutionary paleo experts known as lumpers acknowledge that erectus is a variant form of homo sapiens. We agree. I just put Lamau. So, we finished the Homo erectus chapter, Contested Bones. It was very bad. It was very silly. Hey everyone, Gutsy Gibbon from the future here. I was editing this at my parents' house and I was kind of unhappy with my summary. I think I could have been more concise while also including a better amalgamation of all the things that we found wrong with Contested Bones in this section. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. What was wrong with the Homo erectus section in Contested Bones? Um, everything. Contested Bones asks a really simple question. Is Homo erectus human? Uh, but they do so without defining what human is. In fact, they don't ever define what human is. So we're going to go ahead and address both 
possible meanings of that. Is Homo erectus human as in, is it a member of genus Homo? Yes. So is Homo habilis. So is uh, Homo georgicus, Homo ergaster, Homo neanderthalensis, any member of genus Homo? Yeah, they're human in the sense that they are a part of our genus. Is Homo erectus human in the sense that it is the same categorically or in the same species as Homo sapiens, the way that contested bones wants it to be? Demonstrably, no. We showed this very well in this video, I feel. We looked at several different papers analyzing the levels of variation in Homo erectus, and the bitter truth is for the guys at Contested Bones is that we cannot find any modern human or archaic human that fits the bill with Homo erectus. Homo erectus does not fall within the variation of modern humans, and it does not fall within the variation of modern humans plus archaic humans. It simply doesn't. It, its morphology is more basal, its morphology is more varied, and this is whether or not we consider it to be Homo erectus sensu stricto, so just the, the Chinese and Javan specimens, or whether we're considering Homo georgicus and Homo ergaster to be a part of the species. It doesn't matter, it's too variable. If we included Homo erectus in Homo sapiens and also, you know, everything in between, so things like Hadobergensis, Hadobergensis, things like Neanderthalensis, uh, Naledi, things like that, uh, it would be the most variable species on the planet. So this is not going to be um, tenable for them. Now remember, they tried to explain away this high level of variation in this basal morphology by blaming pathology. But we also showed that things like microcephaly cannot be blamed for the vast majority of the characteristics that Homo erectus has, and even the ones that could potentially be blamed on microcephaly, like a smaller overall brain case size, uh, it doesn't work because the shape is not correct, right? Or other aspects of the morphology don't match microcephaly. This, these individuals are very clearly healthy. And we know this because we have diagnostic characteristics for looking at things like microcephaly in the fossil record due to the entire field of paleopathology. And lastly, and perhaps the most egregious reason why this section was so bad in contested bones, is that they just use only ancient sources, almost exclusively. Everything that they're using, authority quoting and mining to say that Homo erectus should be subsumed into Homo sapiens is from the 1980s, the mid-1980s, or earlier. No one is really saying this today, again, except, you know, Wolpoff, but Wolpoff said it back then, too. He's kind of white-knuckling his idea. He's Alan Fiducheing. But I don't think that it's accidental or coincidental. I think it's on purpose. You can't find any sources today that consider Homo erectus sensu leto as something that should be subsumed into Homo sapiens, that these two animals are the same thing. Um, really, you can't even find anybody who's making that case for Homo erectus sensu stricto. And that's pretty problematic when you think about it, because this entire you know, body of literature was available to them in 2017 when they wrote it. We knew about Demonisi, we knew about Ergaster, we didn't know about either of those in the early 80s, in the early 1980s, but we know about them now, and we knew about them at the time that this book was written, and they were evidently just ignored when it came to finding out whether the experts think that we should subsume Erectus into Sapiens. And I want to correct myself on something while I'm here. While I was editing this, I realized that I use the term Australopithecine a lot, and I use it actually in pretty much every video I've ever made. And it's not been until quite recently that I've been told, informed, chastised, that that's actually not the correct terminology that we should use nowadays. It's it's out of date. Australopith is more appropriate now, so I would say the Australopiths, not the Australopithecines. And the reason for this is that Australopithecus the genus is not monophyletic, so it Australopithecinae doesn't exist, if that makes sense. So Australopiths is more appropriate until we can kind of sort out that phylogeny a little bit more. So apologies. And apologies again for saying femur when I was talking about the pelvis in relation to the anominate. So, pretty deceptive stuff, pretty concerning stuff, don't love it, I'm not moisturized, I'm not in my lane, I'm not hydrated, it makes me feel sick to read contested bones because I think it's a lie, uh, and I find it hard to believe that, you know, Rupe could read that much about human evolution and not realize that he's BSing his audience at least a little bit, uh, but we will continue to touch on more and more and more of Contested Bones moving forward. So my gentle and of course very modern apes, next time we'll be talking about Homo floresiensis, and I'm really excited because since my last Homo floresiensis video, I had the opportunity to talk with Matthew Tochiri, one of the guys who works in Liangbo Cave, which is very exciting for me um, and has given me some interesting insights. He doesn't think it's human, 
Neither does anyone else these days. I'm excited to, to bring that up again next time. Thank you very much. Do take care of yourselves. And I bid thee adieu.